right? <coughs> well, here I am again. So this is my fourth talk in here. So um, for those that have been here since Wednesday, uh, hi again, and for the new people as well. Uh, <coughs> I've been talking for the first three talks about protein folding experiments, different types of things. So I thought that today I will talk about something a little bit different, and it's one type of application going beyond protein folding into a formation of macromolecular assemblies. Okay, so, <coughs> and again, I'm one of the few experimentalists in the audience, so I, I'll try to do this as interesting as possible for people that are more into the theory and, and computation, all right? So, okay, so the, as I said, our idea here is try to look at macromolecular complexes and see how we can find ways of making them. And, you know, the question, fir the first question that comes up is about the motivation. And of course, that seems pretty obvious, you know, because if you think about all the biological machines, molecular machines that you have, you know, the most of them are actually protein assemblies that have allosteric properties. So it seems to make sense, uh, you know, you want to go beyond understanding protein folding into something more at higher scales, uh, you know, understanding how to make assemblies and especially how to make them to have these interesting properties of allosterism. So let me just give you a little bit of introduction first. Um, so obviously, as I said, all these machines are assemblies. And you can see it here clearly in this table, which basically summarizing you know, the type of proteins that you have in the cell. So you can see when you look at just proteins in, in general for any kind of functions, you have about 37% uh, are monomeric proteins, but you know, 63% counting homo and hetero are actually assemblies. So that's telling you that it, you know, when you wanna have complex functionalities, you wanna have typically assemblies. And when you look at this from the point of view of enzymes, in which regulation is important, you know, these numbers are even more clear. So you have about 75% <coughs> of enzymes are actually forming complexes, so they are oligomeric. And of course, you know, when you think about assemblies, you have to think about symmetry. Uh, you know, this is just a simple representation of the most basic symmetries, which are either cyclic or dihedral. You can obviously have combinations of some of those two. They have to do with the axis of, you know, rotation and types of different symmetries. Uh, <coughs> as I said, these are the most simple ones, but you know, you can have comp more complicated things by combining them. All right, so, <coughs> and, and you think about functions that, you know, you could try to implement with this type of assemblies, but you have an anything from enzymes, which as I say, lar they are largely uh, oligomeric, into other machines, you know, ion channels, they are oligomeric, uh, lots of proteins involved in transport and storage, all the chaperone machinery, the proteasome, ribosome, all those things are obviously assemblies. Uh, defense and motors and scaffolding, and you know, people here obviously have, many people here have looked into this type of systems. So anyway, so that this is kind of the motivation. Now we think about this more from the point of view, the design of them. You know, uh, what are the advantages? Well, first one is obvious. You know, once that you have a assembly of subunits, you create new interfaces that can be used for creating new active sites. So structurally there is some uh, usefulness there. At the same time, you know, from the point of view of biology, obviously it makes sense to make uh, smaller subunits and assemble them because that way you can decrease the error rate in protein synthesis. You don't have to make big change. And you also get increased resistance to degradation, denaturation, or even secretion. Uh, for example, the, you know, the kidney barrier, uh, you know, when you have small proteins, they actually get washed out very quickly. You have a big complex, they stay longer in plasm. So, you know, if you're trying to think about make making drugs based on proteins, you know, this is also useful. And, you know, the type of characteristics that you have in order to make these complexes, obviously, you have these interfacial interactions, which are with the ones that allow you to make the assembly. And depending on their strength, you can have complexes that could go from, you know, nanomolar, even picomolar. Some, some of these complexes are much weaker, and they are working in the macromolar higher range. And the types of modes uh, for binding, well, the most standard one, the simplest one, will be self-interactions, in which the structures are rigid. Things just interact. Uh, you can also have heterologous inter interactions, so that makes a uh, rise to heterooligomers. And then what is more interesting from my point of view is this type of advantage coupled with this characteristic, which is basically 
try to create systems that are allosteric, which means they can have ways of introducing new functional regulation or into the system. And the way you do this typically is by coupling the interactions to make the, the interfacial interactions to make the complex with a conformational change in the structure. Okay? And so that's what we mean by allosteric. So, you know, this is a field that has become recently pretty hot. Uh, you know, uh, and representation is all these papers that have appeared recently, last two or three years in science, nature, and so on. I'm going to talk a little bit about them. I just wanted to show this picture. But before that, let me just tell you what the general strategy is when people are trying to do these things. So normally what you do is uh, you obviously define your symmetry rules. So you want to make an assembly. You have to look at the symmetry properties, how many monomers you need, what angles, what axis or rotation, and all of that. And of course, all of this is kind of idealized. You know, the, the kind of information you can get from experiments uh, that are available that is very useful for this type of design is to look at crystal lattices. Uh, you know, here's the representation. Normally, proteins, even when they are monomeric, when they make the crystal, they organize themselves and they organize according to symmetry. Uh, you know, what you find in crystal lattices, even though it's not going to be a complex that is stable in solution, it will give you some ideas on how to put the structure of the monomers into the symmetry rules that you have. And also, they will allow you to define the interaction interfaces, which as you have here. And once that you have that, uh, basically, your idea or the approach would be to try to engineer mutations in all these interfaces uh, in, in order to promote the interaction so that not only in the crystal, but you actually get the assembly in solution. And of course, this process is going to be controlled by <coughs> the assembly process, which is going to be a high order of the monomer concentration and a K-off, which is mostly determined by the interactions that you make by, uh, as I say, engineering the uh, amino acids in, in those regions. Okay, so this is the general approach, and everybody is basically doing the same thing in one way or another. Now, uh, in terms of assemblies, you know, there was a, a lot of interest on this in the early 90s, and people were just using the most simple possible structure, which is the Lewis zipper. And you know, it's nice to use Lewis zippers because you know it's two helices. They they have this <coughs> heptad symmetry in which you have the uh, Lewis in, uh, implicating with one another from one helix to the other, and you know this defines this type of arrangements in which you can have the parallel one, which residues in the D position are interacting and in the A position are interacting, and this defines a little bit of the core, right? And then you have the G to E and E to G interactions that are typically used for defining is the specificity and typically uh, the type of stoichiometry that you have, right? So people were doing lots of experiments with peptides that were only one helix, and they would make uh, dimeric uh, structures like this, or trimeric or tetrameric, depending on the particular int interactions in defined in these positions by the sequence. And then you do anti-parallel, you have a little bit of a different arrangement in which the interactions here go A, a to D and D to A. Okay, so all of this is the classical stuff in the 90s. You know, people more recently were able to actually go from this type of arrangement into something larger, like a seven mer, uh, which has this cyclic structure. And as I said, this is the most basic things. Now, other other kind of attempts to create assemblies has been to you know trying to use this domain swapping idea. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in in a little bit. Uh, and this is something that Eisenberg found, David Eisenberg, and you know, looking at crystal structures and some proteins actually crystallize by swapping domains in which basically the structure opens up. You open, you know, you create new interfaces because the protein has been designed to fall this way anyway. And that way you can make dimers or filaments. It's much harder to actually produce a kind of globular big assembly, symmetric assembly with this type of structure or this type of mechanism, sorry. Now, other things that you can do is basically, you know, you now select some domains that you know they are already forming uh, oligomers. For example, you can make a dimer and a trimer, and now you can fuse them by putting a connection with another another protein chain. And depending on the length and the angle of this particular connection, you can create different symmetries. As you can see in this particular case, you can create this you know this nice cube by making these two. And this is in a way copying what viruses do, right? And you know there are some more examples like this, and you, know, you can see that you know people are now all of a sudden very interested in these things. Another approach that is probably <coughs> More interesting from a protein folding and design point of view is this idea in which you define the symmetry from the crystal lattice, and now you identify the interfaces of interaction, like here in this dihedral two symmetry. You know, it will be these regions here and there, which obviously are symmetric, or in this D4, 
And now what you do is, you know, because you know these are not forming solution, you try to uh, design the interface by changing the amino acids, uh, as you can see over here, so that they will have a strong interaction, so that you will make this very nice complex sensing solution, um, and so on. And you can do the same thing, even with a little bit more sophistication, by rather than using this one, a single component, you optimize interfaces, but using two components. So this is a little bit of a hybrid of the two things that I told you about. So in this case, you have these two different types of trimers because they have different size and different structure, although the same type of symmetry. You can actually uh, design the interface, as you see. You know, these are things that don't interact. They don't have anything to do with one another. But once you define the symmetry and you put it in the right positions, you know, you see there is nothing here making them interact, but now you start changing the amino acids over there, so you create the interface, and that will basically end up making something presumably stable in solution. Uh, you know, these are nice examples of that. And you know, people are even going beyond and try to use this to functional functionalize the assemblies and try to make cool things, like in this case, this particular assembly is combining uh, this type of cage to try to uh, include inside particles of whatever kind, and this is connecting them with a, a domain that is a memory mining domain, that way that will basically act like a little virus. I will, uh, you know, be surrounded by membrane and it will be used for fusion into cells and so on and so forth. Anyway, so all of that is what other people have been doing. And as I say, uh, I think people have been working on this for a long time and it's just in the last two or three or four years that people have been successful. Uh, a lot of these designs that I was talking about have been done with Rosetta and, you know, by David Baker or other, by other people. But what we wanted to do is something a little bit different, which is try to find a way of introducing allosteric control into those. And the idea is really simple, which is, you know, we start from where we were in terms of designing uh, assemblies, which is, you know, the crystal lattice to give us something about symmetry. Now we have a native monomer. And <coughs> rather than thinking about this like a rigid object, now we know this monomer can fold and unfold. And in the process of doing this, it's going to obviously, depending on the mechanism, it's going to produce intermediates that may not be stable particularly, but they may have interfaces that are more prone for assembly than the monomer by itself, because normally monomers are designed to be monomeric. So this is kind of the idea. So in principle, if we can manipulate this process, we may be able to find intermediates in which, in this example, you see this little part is coming off. So, and then now you create a binding interface, and the binding interface is naturally going to be prone for uh, assembly because that's what it does in the monomer as well. And then you can get an assembly uh, that is going to be stabilized by the same type of interactions, and also, you know, for the K-off and the assembly process it's going to be dependent on concentration, but the, the difference here now is that you can control the process by acting on these two equilibria, and that will give you opportunities to control this by temperature, by pH, anything that affects this process, also by binding to effectors, because you could try to define an, an effector that binds to the monomer or to the assembly, and it will go, this will go one way or the other. And you can even do these things like, you know, in trying to introduce uh, photolinks and produce photolysis and in, in order to activate the process or not. Okay, so this is the idea, and now we started looking at this into this protein, which is a very well-known protein in this community, it's the CI2, it's model for protein folding for many years. This is a very relatively small protein, it's a serine protease inhibitor, so it's a protein with a function. It has this loop, which is actually, even though here it looks pretty floppy, it's quite rigid. There is a lot of uh, amino acids here, and it's a hydrophobic core that is fixing this into specific co uh, co uh, conformations so that this methionine binds into the side of the protease and it blocks the, the reaction. Okay? It's a paradigm of two-state folding, and we know this because when you do a chevron plot, it looks like this nice V-shape. I'm not going to tell people here what a chevron plot is because I think all you all know. And also because when you do thermal unfolding and do calorimetry, you have this heat capacity, I mean, this uh, activation hit, uh, and then what you see is that, you know, when you do a Van Hoff analysis, you get something very close to one, which is basically what you get by comparing the area over the curve with the height, and that tells you that the system is pretty much twisted-like. No, so these are the general features for this protein, but, you know, it's also interesting from our point of view, uh, this protein has a very slow unfolding, 
very stable, kinetically stable protein. And you can see this by extrapolating this limb here in the chevron all the way to uh, native flight conditions. And you see that the time that the protein remains folded is about 5,000 seconds. And then it unfolds and quickly refolds back. Okay? Uh, so it stays in unfolded state for a very short period of time, which is characteristic of protease inhibitors because they don't want to be degraded by the protease. All right? So it's also then it has a four molar guanidinium hydrochloride uh, midpoint denaturation and also a very high temperature for folding, uh, folding temperature, 360. And you know, this protein, by the way, I'm going to emphasize it, although uh, I don't think in this audience is necessary, is fully monomeric in solution. Okay? And we know this, we, we kind of tested this again on the wild type protein using analytical centrifugation. We could go up to almost 1.5 millimolar and the protein was nicely monomeric. So it doesn't seem to be doing anything. Uh, along the lines of aggregating or forming assemblies. However, when you look at the crystal structure, and this is something that was already known in the origi original structure from the wild type, the protein actually forms this very nice uh, dodecameric ring uh, in the crystal lattice. Okay? Uh, and as I say, in the original crystal structure, that was already found. But when you look at this, you know, it only appears the monomer, so because th this is considered to be a packing artifact, so they don't even show it. But you know, trying to explore this was a particular condition, situation or not, we did crystallography in collaboration with somebody in group uh, that is part of a network that we are as well in Spain. We were doing, a, a, you know, trying crystallizing this with many different conditions, and you have here a list of them. And in all these conditions, we found that the protein always crystallizes in the same type of symmetry, same time space group, and in the same type of assembly. Okay, so this seems to be something that, even though it doesn't appear in solution the protein has a natural tendency from the properties of the, of the shape of the molecule, the monomer, to, to make this, okay? Uh, and as I say, it's interesting because uh, there's, there's two six-member rings that are staggered one with one another, and you, as you can see here in this representation. Now, the other interesting thing is all these conditions are basically using ammonium sulfate as the precipitant in the crystal in crystallization assays. Now, if you try to do the same thing, but now using a PEG, polyethylene glycol rather than ammonium sulfate, you find out that the protein still crystallizes nicely and it crystallizes with the same space group and the same symmetry and you forming the same type of complex, but now the monomers are actually domain swapping. And you can see here, this is the, the first one I was showing to you before with these conditions and with these other conditions, what you have now is the, the C-terminal part of the protein is open and it goes across well, from one ring to the next to the other one back and it connects both of them making this so the dodecameric structure is more stable, okay? So this happens in this, all of this is wild type protein, and all of this is happening uh, depending on the crystallization condition. So what this is telling us is that this structure is kind of uh, written into the shape and the properties, the molecular properties of the monomer, and also that, you know, there's a possibility, even though the protein is very stable, to domain swap, and this domain swapping tells us that we may be able to do this kind of trick that I was talking about before. Uh, this is just adding polyethylene glycol to the wild type, crystallizes, and it crystallizes domain swapping. And the, it doesn't matter which other conditions you, you do. All of those are domain swapped. All of these are not domain swapped. Actually, the original, you know, because the original structure was done by Max Perutz, he did some mutants as well, in which he was putting a whole bunch of um, <coughs> uh, glutamines in a tray because we were interested in this aggregation of the polyglutamines. And then he found that those mutants domain swapped. Yeah, so what you can see here is, you know, you look at the monomer, is the loop, the active loop is the one that is basically making the connection. So is the last uh, part of the protein, which is the two strands and the connected loop that are opening, the loop is going across, and now the, uh, the other two strands are going to the other side. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we go back to the design. So we had this monomeric protein that we know in the crystal does this. Now, the idea is try to find ways of introducing mutations into the protein so that it will do this in solution, and ideally with this kind of contr allosteric control that we want. So we had this kind of mutational strategy in which obviously the, cre the clear thing that we wanted to do is try to speed up the unfolding rate, because remember that it's very slow, and the idea here is try to induce some partial unfolding, right? So in, in order to do that, we did 
several mutations that try to increase the local uh, interactions or force field term uh, versus the non-local. Uh, also try to lose the tertiary packing of the hydrofoil core a little bit. And then obviously we wanted to maintain the topology and so on. So the mutations that we came up with were this tank here. Uh, you can see a little bit how they look like Oops. on the structure. They are all in the core. They are quite conservative mutations because normally what we are doing is typically truncations or things like that. Uh, they are all spread out through the protein. So that was kind of the strategy. All right. So we looked at these mutations and then produced the mutants. And all of this work was done, by the way, by Luis Campos, who is right here in the audience. I will show his picture later so that you can not miss him. Anyway, so uh, so that was the, the we made the mutant, and now the idea is to characterize this mutant because it's ten mutations, so you never know. Uh, so the first thing we did is NMR, and uh, when we did the NMR, we solved the structure by you know getting the full assignment, doing a CS Rosetta. So it's not a full structure, but it's uh, you know the model structure by CS Rosetta using the NMR chemical shift is very similar to the wild type, as you can see here, the red uh, and the blue, the red. I believe is the wild type and the blue is the mutant, right? <laughs> and <coughs> so that's the first thing, we have the structure. Now the second thing is what happens with the stability and the folding and this is what we find here. So the wild type as you see in chemical denaturation is very stable. Now what we see is the mutant is folded but is much less stable. So the CM goes from four to 1.2. And also as we were trying to anticipate, the Chevron plot for the wild type is like this, and the mutant is basically shows that all the destabilization is being by speeding up the unfolding rate. Okay, so now we have a protein that is stable, but is much more on the on the side of unfolding. Okay, and it's unfolding much more quickly. All right, and now the the other thing that we know from uh, you know when we look at this protein is that even though it has ten mutations, still keeps the protease inhibitor activity. Obviously, it's more flexible, which means that it's not as active, but it still works. Okay, so this is a typical enzymatic assay, uh, and it's a competitive assay because you know it's an inhibitor, and we see that you know we need more concentration of protein uh, to get the same effect, but you know we can get it. All right. So now, what happens with the properties of the protein in with respect to assembly? So what we have here is uh, some experiments using size exclusion chromatography, very simple experiments in which. You look at the protein profile coming out of one size exclusion column. I, it, this position here is typical for the monomer. Uh, this position here is for some aggregate that has the size expected for something that is a mix of uh, hexamer and dodecamer. And you can see this with concentration. So when you have uh, something in the 100 millimolar range, sorry, 100 micromolar range, it's basically only monomer. When you go to one millimolar, you have a lot of this sort of stuff going on. You can do the same type of experiments using analytical ultracentrifugation, which is a different type of technique. In this case, you can separate better the peaks. Yeah, you, this is a simple titration. Yes, you have a fixed concentration, and you make the you know you run it on the column, or you put it into the you know rotor and spin it for a while. You can also do multi-angle light scattering, which is another combined with size exclusion chromatography, which is basically a way of doing this experiment by looking at the profile by light scattering, so a multi-angle, so you can get information about the stoichiometry and so on. Here we can distinguish very clearly that we have monomer, hexamer, and dodecamer, uh, which is corresponding to these peaks over there. Okay. So now we know that this monomer pro monomeric protein, when we mutate it this way, forms these assemblies, assemb some assemblies that seem to be relatively specific, uh, but we don't know whether it's forming what we wanted to, what we wanted it to form. So the next thing to do will be to do electron microscopy, and uh, this is some of the summary of those experiments. We did this also in collaboration in Madrid with another group in our in the institute that we have there, <coughs> and in this case, basically, what I like to say is that this we could find uh, particles that look like, you know, rings by first approximation. Now the problem is these particles are pretty dynamic, pretty flexible, and then in order to do more detailed analysis, what we wanted, what we ended up doing is basically so something that people in electron microscopy do, do quite a lot, is to uh, try to stabilize these particles uh, by using something like a cross-linking agent in combined in combination with a with a gradient of glycerol in an SDS page. So that way you can select and stabilize the particular 
different uh, oligomers and then look at them with a doing single particle recognition analysis, uh, from all those, and then get a model of the structure. And this is what you get. Uh, this is a basically, you can see it's a ring. It has the six uh, fold symmetry, exactly what we expected. You can also see that the domains seem to be staggered. The dimensions are also as expected, 15 astronauts for the hole in the middle, about 19 astronauts for the particle. This is a little bit bigger than in crystallography, but this is coming from negative staining. So it kind of makes sense. All right, so this is for the particle. Now we know the particle is forming in solution and it has the right shape and symmetry and everything else. Now what is going on with the monomer inside? What kind of structure does it have? So here we try to do crystallography and we tried really hard, I mean, Luis particularly, in collaboration with our crystallographer group in, in Madrid, but we couldn't crystallize this structure. And the problem is that the, this equilibrium is very dynamic and there is no way to find conditions that it will crystallize. Okay, so the next thing to do then would be try the NMR. Um, by NMR, here obviously we have a problem to start because the monomer is only 7 kilodalton, which is fine, but the assembly, especially the dodecameric assembly, is about 84 kilodalton. And what that means is that uh, this, is, this type of structure will not be visible by NMR. Okay, because it's too s slow tumbling and then the lines will be really broad and it will basically disappear from the, from the spectrum. However, we tried. And this is actually the way we got the structure from the monomer anyway. So this is here, I'm going to show you an example of how this looks like. If you find conditions, for in this case it's 1 millimolar and 320 Kelvin, in which we know from analytical centrifugation we had 10% of the monomer, 90% of the assembly. And if we now look at an HSQC spectrum, as what you have here, uh, this is a typical spectrum in which you have correlations, cross correlation between the amide uh, nitrogen and the amide proton. And this is what people in NMR call the fingerprint for the, for the protein. So all the blue dots here correspond to the monomer. We could assign them all. You can see the dart there. And this is where we get the structure from, as I said. But in addition to those, we could see all these other peaks, which are shown here in red, highlighted in red, that, that were much more intense. And you can see how intense they were by looking at across, you know, a cut across here. You can see that all the blue peaks are about 10% of the, say, 12% of the intensity of the red peaks. Okay, that already hinted us that this could be coming from the oligomer. Then when you actually change concentration, so you will shift this equilibrium one way or another, what you do see is that the intensity ratios, they actually track each other. So what that means is that this is definitely coming from the oligomer. Now the question is, how could this be the oligomer? Because we shouldn't be able to see it. And the answer for that is actually that what's going on here is, and you can see it, you know, anybody here that knows a little bit of NMR will realize quickly that all these signals are clustered around 8 ppms. And this is characteristic of random cold values, right? So all these residues actually have very different chemical shapes in the monomer than in the oligomer. In the oligomer, they are all corresponding to random cold values, which means that basically what's going on here is that when the protein is forming the assembly, this piece of the protein is actually becoming disorganized, disordered. And because it's disordered, you know, you have values that are random cold, but also you get to see them. Because now the complex is moving slowly but the tail is disorganized and it's flexible, so you get to see that, okay? And this is where we can get that information. So we cannot solve the structure of the monomer in the complex, but at least we know that what makes the protein form the assembly is actually having this tail, the C-terminal tail, these residues here, coming off the structure, okay? So that goes into this idea that we had from the beginning, so that's great news. Now, uh, since we couldn't get a structure, now we try to do some modeling and see whether we can get information about this uh, from the molecular point of view, as I said. And then since we knew from NMR that what's going on is that this C-terminal structure, uh, sorry, C-terminal tail is becoming unstructured, what we did is a little computational experiment, which is as you have here, you get the monomer, and then by, you know, we pull this C-terminal away. <coughs> so the protein has still the same structure. The only thing that we are doing is taking the C-terminals uh, into some unstructured situation. Uh, and we did the same thing with the N-terminus, just as a negative control, because we wanted to see whatever we, we find. You know, it would be nice if it were specific. And now what we're going to do here is to run some ND, a few ND simulations, and see whether there is some structural change going on. Okay? And this is the result. So I'm going to start with this one. So when we open the N-terminus, as you can see here, the, you know, and you can see that both the N and the C-termini are both strands, and they are both forming part of this four-stranded sheet that you have over here. 
the C terminus is kind of in between and the N terminus is on the edge, okay? So you take the, the N terminus away, you run the these simulations and what you see is, the, you know, the protein very quickly reorganizes and puts the, the strand back in there, right? So you, you go back to a final structure that is very similar to the original one, as you can see here in the RMSD. However, when you do this with the C terminus, as you have here, obviously it's a little bit of a more drastic change because you're making a hole in the center of the protein. And now the protein is undergoing some structural change very quickly, and it does this you know, in several runs. And in that change, what, what happens, as you can see here, is the C terminus remains completely open, and the, C, the, N, the N terminal strand, which is on the edge here, basically moves all the way here to close. And now you have a three-stranded sheet, and you have a, a nice core made, but you have this tail flopping around, okay? So now this structure is different from the original one, and so the next thing to do is to see whether we can model this into the structure of the assembly that we have from crystallography and see whether we can rationalize this, making better interactions. And this is what we did and what we are showing here. This is the wall type uh, <coughs> interface between two monomers in one of the six member rings in the wall type X-ray structure. And you can see in that structure, the contacts between monomers in the six member ring, they're actually very weak. Uh, you know, you have these very few contacts, and it's mostly these uh, hydrophobic contacts with this valine 33 in one monomer and the leucine 56 in another one. And that probably explains why when you have this crystal lattice, it forms, but when it's in solution, it's not stable enough. Now, the interesting thing is that now you substitute this protein structure by this model that we got by removing the C-terminal strand. And what we find now is in much, you know, fine conditions. You know, we did all of this by, with Robetta, by the way. Fun conditions in which we can optimize contacts. Now the interface is a little bit different and we have many more contacts and you can see here, even this valine 11 now is surrounded by several hydrophobics. And now what we have is a much more uh, snug uh, monomer into monomer interface. Okay, and you know, yes. The monomer is fully folded. Uh, this is the, yeah, this is taken, okay, one second. Is that? Uh, no, this probably because in the model that we got, it, this eventually, because we were using Robetta, basically stuck then. So it, That, that's a good point. I mean, I get. Yeah, yeah, but but. Yeah, I know, I know. What 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 he's saying is that in the complex structure that we modeled, it's back in. Well, to some degree, right? Because it's interacting. This is what. I, this is what I'm saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this may be not perfect model, so, and maybe this interaction. F 56 is right on the interface, it, uh, you know, it's very close. Yeah, so this is what I was trying to get at here, right? So 59 is the very last one that is in the red, I guess. And, and everything beyond that is actually participates in the domain swapping, and this is where I was getting a little bit confused, but not in the intermediate that we get. That's right. Okay, thanks for pointing that out, you were quick. All right, so this, is, this gives us a structure of this monomer in the assembly, and you know, the assembly that you get from here is a little bit different, and it fits even better into the electron density that we have, although you know, they are very, very similar actually, but Slightly better. Okay, so now the next thing that we want to see here is to whether this behaves in the ways we were meaning to. And in order to do this, what we can try to see is whether this could work as an allosteric switch uh, controlled by temperature. 
Uh, you know, the first indication that this is the case, we get it from this very simple experiment. Here we're looking at this by fluorescence. Uh, this is temperature and this is the fold diffraction you get. This is the wall type for reference. And now you get here a very unusual behavior because, you know, normally you would expect that if you are looking for an assembly, the assembly, the concentration should stabilize the assembly. It should make the unfolding uh, to happen at higher temperatures. And what we see is just the opposite, right? So you see that a lot, you know, at high concentrations, the protein is very unstable. And as we increase, uh, as we decrease the concentration, the protein becomes more stable. So what this is basically telling us is there is a coupling, a negative coupling between the concentration of the monomer and the stability of the protein, which means we are probably inducing un partial unfolding or unfolding by temperature. And that's what is, sorry, by temperature, no, by increasing the concentration of monomer. Now, you can do the same thing by differential scanning calorimetry, and then here what you find is this very intriguing behavior. I mean, actually, for calorimetry, this is a big surprise because nobody has ever seen a protein that is able to have two very nice, very separated peaks like this. When people have intermediates, normally they have a little bump on top of the other peak. Here we have this clear behavior, but it's also very concentration-dependent. So you can see that at very high concentrations, uh, you know, close to one millimolar, you have two nice peaks. One has a a maximum temperature on the order of 315, and another one are on the order of 370, okay? Now, if we decrease the temperature, what happens is that this, this peak moves to higher temperatures and this peak to lower temperatures. And at the end, when you go to sufficiently low temperatures in which we know there is no assembly, you have a single peak. So how do we interpret this? Well, what we think is happening here is uh, in these conditions, you only have monomer. The monomer is relatively less stable than the wall type monomer, and this is why the temperature is about 335 Kelvin, uh, and nothing else is going on. But as you increase temperature, what you're doing is inducing some partial unfolding, and that's what this peak is, right? So this is an exothermic peak. It's telling you there is some partial uh, unfolding. We think it's partial, and we know it's actually, a, you know, whatever structure is unfolding is becoming destabilized by increasing concentration. And then what we think is going on here is actually the melting of the whole complex later on, all right? So let me just put this into context. So the best way to interpret this is with this kind of model in which basically what we think is going on is in these conditions we have the protein like this, all right, at low temperatures. And if it, we increase temperature, it will go directly from here I into there without passing through here, okay? When we are higher temperatures on the other hand, the first thing that is going on is the protein it's natively folded, it's becoming this intermediate with the C-terminal open, and that's this peak. So this is going on here in this range of temperatures at these particular concentrations. Then after that, this is aggregation or assembly competent. So you make the hexamer and the dodecamer, all of this is in equilibrium, all of this is going on here, okay, in this region. And then when we keep increasing temperature, now these complexes are actually unfolding, and then you see all of this. And we know this is reversible, so we can wait on, we had to wait almost a day or two days, and we repeat the experiment and we get it back, almost completely, 90% or so, okay? So basically what this tells you is that, uh, you know, if you forget about this part, normally you wouldn't be interested in this. Here you have a nice allosteric control because, you know, depending on what concentration you are working on and depending on the temperature, you can switch this to from here into there, back and forth, all right? All right, so this is kind of the idea. So now what we're trying to do, this is a little bit of future uh, projects. I'm going to go very quickly through this. So we are trying to find other mutations. Well, first of all, back up on these mutations and see which ones were more important and which ones were less. Also try to find different mutations that will promote more assembly or less assembly, or one way or the other. We, s we are also trying to stabilize the examer versus the dodecamer. We would like to get examer only or the other way around, the dodecamer only versus examer. Um, you know, this is a little bit of a summary of those. Going quickly through this, here you have some experiments with some of these mutations. Uh, this is, uh, again, the size exclusion chromatography. And you can see that the 10 mutations that I've been talking about, which is this guy, has the dodecamer and the examer, both of them. When you actually revert this mutation here, which latches this, uh, this loop and it decreases the probability of domain swapping, then what you actually do is eliminate or almost completely the dodecamer and you get the examer. And this makes sense because the domain swapping structure is the one that stabilizes the dodecamer because it goes across, okay? Now, in this other arc here, what we are doing is trying to increase the propensity to open the C-terminals with these other mutations, the 59, as you were talking about, 
uh, Joseph and also 59 and 62. So all of those are in the central middle region. And then here what you see is that you go from this type of configuration into less dodecamer and more hexamer and even almost all hexamer. Okay? And we are trying to also get the dodecamer. In this case, what we are doing this by putting a disulfide that goes across the rings. And of course, when you make this oxidize, you, make, you get a mess, but you can purify this part, and then you can see that this remains stable after one day. So, you know, we, we basically have ways of making the glucomer. And you can also do truncations. We truncated the C-terminus, and then in this case, what we did is, rather than having a monomer, now we have a dimer. This is a domain swap dimer that we get all the time, which also oligomerizes, but at the same time, it oligomerizes and makes rings. It's also able to make this type of fibular structures, which are not amyloids. What they are really is actually uh, dimers that are put in line one with another. So this is more similar to an actin filament than actually an amyloid. And the nice thing about this also is that we can actually rescue the, the monomer by adding the peptide with the C-terminal fragment and basically going back. So you know this could be used as another way of control, you know, adding the, the fragment. And with this, I'm going to finish uh, so that we have a little bit of time for questions. These are some other plans. And so this, let me just acknowledge people. So this is the group that still have, all, although it's in a transient situation right now uh, in Spain, combination of Indian Sciences and the Nat National Center of Biotechnology. This guy here, Luis, who's right over there, is the guy that has basically work, been working on this for in all the protein engineering experiments. Uh, in collaboration with Rajendra, which is a PhD student in the group, and then also in collaboration with these other groups in Spain, the NMR in collaboration with Eva de Alba, calorimetry with Jose Manuel Sanchez Ruiz, University of Granada, Jose Mario Alpuesta for the electron microscopy, Herman Rivas for the analytical transfugation, and Antonio Romero for the crystallography. And all of this basically is collaborations that were initiated by a network that was funded by the Spanish Ministry of Education, or actually the economy and comp competitiveness now, when they actually care about research, which is not the case now anymore, but you know, this was, say, 2010. And you know it's been continued funded by the European Research Council. And just to finish, this is the group that I have now in California. That nobody here has done anything related to this project. But just wanted to show that they are there, and you know they also deserve some credit. Okay, thank you. <laughs>